So we left off last time uh, with uh, thoughts on Hamlet uh, and uh, the way in which he set himself up as a uh, trying to orchestrate the uh, ouster of his uncle slash um, stepfather uh, now that he's been um, apprised of the fact that his his uncle has murdered his father by the ghost, but there's some doubt in his mind, I think, at least it's borne out by some of the words that he says, that uh, he might be deceived in this. So he wants to make sure, uh, because he does not want to send an innocent man to the grave himself and thereby be guilty of murder. So there are actually moral reservations that he has that restrain his action, and we looked at him as a very much a foil for uh, Fortinbras, because Fortinbras has also lost his father and is also the leg legitimate heir, just like Hamlet is. There's, they're both legitimate, so if you want to compare it to the play we just did, Lear, we have legitimate uh, heirs, uh, Cordelia being the most legitimate of the three daughters. All three are legitimate, obviously, in the sense that they're natural offspring of Lear, but she was the most loving of the three daughters, the most worthy and the most faithful. And we also had Edgar, who was a legitimate heir. But the bastard Edmund uh, played on that very thing, what legitimacy was. And, and Lear began the play by throwing off the question of legitimacy, he said it was irrelevant. And really what it was is about um, virtue signaling. It's not about virtue, it's about signaling virtue with the game of equality. And so then it became about power and power overthrew legitimacy. And the effect of that was to destroy Lear and his own mind. So he exercised power, yet with no sense of legitimacy in, in sight, in the game of equality. A and Hamlet is doing something very si similar to the play, because it's questioning the relation of power to legitimacy. Because of course, Claudius now has the power. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and he can exercise it, but on what foundation has it been set? And Shakespeare is always exploring these themes, it seems to me, throughout all of the plays. This, uh, the relation between moral legitimacy and, and power and how to uh, operate rightly. And he reinforces that. And we just heard a little skit on uh, uh, and discussion of Lady Macbeth and the fragmentation of her mind. That's characteristic of all Shakespeare's heroes, as they degenerate morally, they become, uh, in terms of their speech, they become fragmented. And, and so Shakespeare is constantly reinforcing through multiple means uh, the importance of, of not just political order, but moral order uh, for holding on to what we would call a sane mind. So sanity and insanity, both which he portrays again regularly in his plays, uh, and it will be the case in, in Hamlet as well because he, he has now resolved to put on an antic disposition. That's his phrase. So he's acting. Um, nonetheless, uh, there's a suggestion that he is mad. He appears mad, certainly. And Ophelia will literally go mad. She loses all sense of herself. And that's because of the degeneration of the political and the familial order and its severance from uh, the moral order. So all of these are consistent themes, and I think they're very, really interesting. Um, but we left off, and, and uh, one of the main things that is, um, I think, so appealing about Hamlet is, is actually his relationship with Ophelia. So she is a minor character, really. She's not a major character, although sh she's prominent in the play at the outset. For, in terms of power politics, she's a minor character. In terms of the interest of the audience, I don't think she's a minor character. She's, a, she's a, an important character. And his relationship to her is of interest to the, to the audience. And, uh, and it's testified to in, in the way it's portrayed in, uh, in uh, music and in art thereafter. Ophelia lying in the water and the you know, in the uh, pre-Raphaelite painters and, uh, and uh, operas written on Ophelia and Hamlet and so forth. So she becomes quite a famous figure unto herself. 
So the question really is, does Hamlet actually love her? And that's what they're all trying to figure out in Acts 1 and 2. Polonius and, and uh, her brother Laertes counseling her on how he might, how she might relate to a prince since the prince is not in the position to marry her, how she ought to govern herself in relation to that. But Hamlet has professed that he loves her and Ophelia uh, believes it. So she's in no doubt about it. Um, and, and she has a stronger sense of his love than the counsel that's been given to her. So her father, you know, beware, Laertes, beware. Um, and both of them have told her something which she can't understand, which is that there are larger forces at work in his life than uh, Hamlet's life is not his own. Because he's the son of the king, he will be pushed into uh, relinquishing even his legitimate desire for you. Even if it is genuine, he will be forced uh, by circumstances and by those around him to uh, not put himself first. He will have to think about his role in the kingdom. But she, he wrote these love letters to Ophelia proclaiming his love and he showed in some ways, I wanted, this is what I wanted to uh, light upon a bit here because it explains also something else. How as a Renaissance man, Hamlet would have a certain ideal of love. And it's not just of the courtly lover. The courtly lover is a little different because in the courtly love tradition, uh, the man ha is in love with a social superior. That's not the case here. And yet he has idealized her in some way. So it's not, it's not the case that he loves a superior woman in the social rank and, and in, uh, or even morally in some ways. But he does love her and there's an ideal that's expressed in that. And that is really an expression of, of Renaissance Neoplatonism. And the fact that, that love acts like a ladder that takes us up in, in, um, uh, in following its dictates, like a ladder up to God who is love. So by idealizing our love and acting upon it, we are brought closer to God himself. That seems to be his sense of that. So he's, he's, it's a reflection on the beauty of God, which is reflected in the beauty of woman by, by by idealizing her in some sense, he is becoming more himself. Um, and as I say, it explains, it explains his response to his mother. He seems really troubled, not only by the murder of his father, but by the wantonness of his mother. It, it sounds misogynist even, right? The, the language it really is angry with his mother you know, frailty thy name is woman, that lines like that. But worse than that, the, the re references to incest and so forth. Um, and um, and, and uh, that one speech where he said that he would no longer be, uh, trust a woman. I mean, again, strong statements, but it's a reflection on his mother. Yes, but it, I think it also has an effect on his relationship with Ophelia then. So she gets caught in the wake of that uh, disenchantment with, the, uh, uh, with his ideal of the opposite sex. Because both sexes, when they fall in love, tend to idealize their, uh, the opposite, right? He or she is going to be like this, and then the reality not so much so. Well, in this case, it's not just that the reality falls short of the ideal, it is the total contradiction of it. So he, he, in some sense, has been broken, not just by the loss of his father, but by the loss of his mother as an ideal figure of the woman. And Ophelia gets caught in the wake of that. That's my sense, psychologically. Again, this is very much, and this is why the Romantics loved this play, why Harold Bloom loved this play. It is very much an ex exploration of the human psyche. And I think it's plausible. That's why Shakespeare's so good. Uh, it has that, it has the whiff of, of credibility about it. So he's been disillusioned by his mother's actions and that is effect, it affects all his relationships. And so when he puts on an antic disposition, he does choose to do so in order to be incognito. Remember Edgar did the same. He plays like Tom of Bedlam. He acts like he's mad when he isn't mad. There's an element of Hamlet in which he's, the reason he can act so well is because he's sort of lost it. He really has. And it's not clear to the audience 
how much he's acting and how much he has actually come apart a bit. And I think it's, it's ambiguous for a reason. I think there's an element that he has uh, been broken by this episode. And maybe that also goes some way to explaining why he can't act. Because to act would be to recover and fix things and bring back an order, but he's not in the position to do that yet psychologically. He's a, he's a broken man. Yes? Did Shakespeare know anybody Sorry? Did Shakespeare know anybody of course he did. Mad? Yeah, no, of course he did. I mean, there's a, there's a whole region of, of London called Bedlam where, where people uh, who suffered from what we call mental illness, uh, they would just call it in, insanity. Uh, but it weren't the, the word sane in, in uh, Latin just means healthy. So to be insane is unhealthy. Well, what does that mean? What exactly? I mean, I mean, there's a, there are there are things that reflect that, but what what is that? It's an it, it's reflected by orderliness, and a sense of, of of self possession that you're in control of yourself. There's also the element of of the moods that you would have, so they'd be cheerful as opposed to downcast. The, but there's a whole variety of things, and the, some of them are relational as well, and all of those things would suggest. And we just saw Lady Macbeth. She she's caught in that moment in Act 5, Scene 1, where she's trying to wash the blood off her hands. There is no blood on her hands. And she did, uh, she wanted the king to be murdered so that she could uh, have a future as queen. And yet she's stuck back in that moment when the action, and she can't move beyond it. And she's a fragmented character. That's, she's disjointed by it. So these are all expressions of insanity. But What's, what, do, what does to be healthy mean here? Uh, it seems to me to have a moral component, right? It, you're, you're at odds with the moral order of things. You don't, set, you don't sense the providence of God in anything, or you're at odds with it, or you're outside of it. And the characters' uh, moral transgressions have placed them in a place where they're not able to act physically properly, which is not to say that uh, to conclude, and this would be a false conclusion, that if somebody has mental health problems, that's because they're, they're a sinner or something like that. That's, he's not saying that, but he, he is connecting them at, at some level at least. Comment? I would say also that in Shakespeare's time, there was a broader definition of that. Because uh, that being of, of madness yes. or, or insanity, and that like, because even things like being willing to have sex before marriage could be considered a, a, an insane act. It is, a, act yeah, very, insanity. very good. It is an act of insanity because it's unhealthy. It's not, it doesn't fit with the order of things the way God intended them and therefore, yes, that's correct. So, I mean, there was any number. And, and just like Lear, Lear giving up his throne is equally an act of insanity right. on the political level. And Shakespeare's audience would have immediately concluded that. We would just say, well, that's his choice. He decided to abdicate the throne and divide the kingdom up. Well, both of them are crazy. Abdicating firstly, but dividing the kingdom, well, this is what happens in a civil war. Why have you just brought that about? This is insane on the political level. And he degenerates from that. But you're right, it's a much broader, uh, and that's because they never see them as we do. We live in a very individualistic world. His world, everything connects. And particularly if you're a position of, of uh, like a king, your, your actions have a wide and long effect on others around you, relationally and otherwise. Yes? It's not only mental illness, but it's foolishness or things that would make somebody incredulous. Make somebody? Incredulous. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, in the case of Lear, even his, uh, his, his daughters say he hath, but ever, he hath ever but slenderly known himself. He's a man who had all power and yet was not in possession of his own. He didn't even know who he was, which uh, ever since Socrates has been the definition of this is the purpose in human, you know, know thyself. You need to know, who, and, and Polonius, that's the wise advice he gives to thine own self. Be true, and then thou canst to no man be false. Right, so that you know who you are, and then if you then if you act in accordance with that, you will have integrity. I mean, it's the Jordan Peterson advice, right? Be know who you are, and then act in accordance with it, because there's always a risk. But at least now the risk will be on the basis of a sense of uh, who you are, and you can act with integrity then. 
Except now it, in Shakespeare, it's not just you have an integrity within yourself. There's a much broader sense, as you just said, it's integrity with the way things actually are and the order of things. So that's where a, a Jordan Peterson's advice to an individualistic world differs from Shakespeare's advice. Like this isn't just good for me, it's good for everyone. That's, yes. So if um, integrity is connected with um, and Shakespeare's mind, um, immoral, unethical, and immoral actions, then wouldn't that be immoral? Yes, yes. 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 Yeah, so it's, uh, and, and that seems biblical again. So who sinned? Was it, was it him or was it his parents? Right. Or was it, did she actually sin? I don't think so. Or was there... No, she's the victim of others' actions. Yeah. That's, that's the tragedy of Ophelia. You could almost call it the tragedy of Ophelia because there's a tragedy within the tragedy. Hers is maybe the most because she is the pawn of dad, boyfriend, king, brother. brother. She has no agency. And having ha lost all of those things, she loses it. But yes, sin can be something that you commit yourself or it can be something you suffer from others and you nonetheless bear the marks of it. And they may get off scot-free. They're going forward as if, they hadn't, you know, as if they hadn't committed it. Now, I don't think that happens. I do think it affects even, and particularly, the person who commits it. But it, the effects might not be apparent at first because some are a bit more resilient and it takes time for that to play out. And she breaks because she has nothing. She has no means of, uh, she has no identity anymore. She's been robbed of it just the way Hamlet has and the way um, Fortinbras has. Both of them lose their identity, but they have, a, they have a way of recovering it, and that's through acting. She has no such recourse. Again, yes? Agency. Agency. We can act. Again, again, I, I just noticed this in my lit, noted this in my lit theory class. With the, the model of human nature up until the Renaissance or until the Romantics is that we have, we have agency. We are able to act. That's why we watch dramas. It's an action, and we like to imitate it, and we think something real is happening because we have the capacity to act and change our circumstances for the better. Whereas in the modern conception of human nature where we're organisms, we just suffer action. There's no, you can't change it. You're, the environment around you conditions everything. Which is problematic because it'll do what makes you happy. It's a problem if, you're, if your life is pretty crap. <laughs> then you can't change it. You have no means of, of changing it. It also doesn't suggest, uh, the Christian faith doesn't work with the organic view of life. Where, where God rescues you from your sin and he sets you on a path, gives you a new nature, and now you can follow him. Well, you have the agency to actually repent, turn your back on your old ways, and you can go in a different direction, totally different direction. You can follow him. That's a, a meaningful, uh, joyous life. It doesn't mean that uh, everything there is gone, but now you have agency to do that. Now, that's, that gives you hope. We talked about suicide as well. Suicide, the word is despair. This is the sin, it's despair. But this is just from the, the Latin verb for hope, which is sparrow. And you lack hope, there's no hope. And the reason why suicide was considered to be such a grievous sin is that you have, there's no remedy for you if you won't look to above you to God for the means of rescue, because that's the only means you have to rescue yourself, actually, because you can't save yourself. Uh, well, that's the debate over the grave diggers. We'll leave that to the grave diggers, that scene. I'm not totally pushing it, but that's what she's talking about. What's she doing in here? You know, because she, she committed suicide, how come she's getting a good burial as if she'd been a good Christian woman? Because if she were a poor person like us, she'd be, she wouldn't be allowed to be buried. So there's a discussion of that. 
Yeah, old Yorick. So that's, it's, she fell into the water and drowned. Well, I, I mean, no sense of that, but I mean, she, there's a sense it was an accident. She just, having fallen in the water, decided not to try and get herself out of the water. Which is not completely impossible in that day, given the... The weight of the dresses the and so forth? Yeah, maybe. But there's, a, so that I, all I'm saying is that there's a, there's a little bit of gray area around that. It's ambiguous and um, she didn't want to live. That's plain from the lines before it, whether she, I mean, she fell, the branch broke, so she didn't decide to jump in. So they resolve the ambiguity because she's, uh, a, at least according to the grave diggers, because she's the, wa the daughter of a, an important man. And so she gets buried a Christian burial. But they're looking at these sorts of things. and. At any rate, um, I said I wanted to come to the means by which Hamlet is going to try and exercise his agency, which is a very Shakespearean means of exercising agency, which is to have others act on your behalf. This is through the dramaturge figure, uh, which Hamlet is now. He is the playwright, and he is going to direct the play within the play, the thing wherein to catch the conscience of the king, and uh, that is an interesting way to actually act. It's not acting, it's act, watching others act. And yet, if you think about it, Shakespeare, is our, uh, as a Renaissance dramatist, is our teacher. And he is trying to, by when we love to imitate, as Aristotle says, we do so because we like to act. We like to see action, and we like to act in accordance with, with the actions that we've seen, those that we find praiseworthy we will imitate, and those which we find despicable we will try and avoid. And so uh, having lost his place in the kingdom, having no means of acting against the king, he concocts this play in order to reassert his agency and to, to uh, change the tune against the king. And so it's the power of theater. So I, well, let's pick it up with that. It's act two, scene two, and then we'll move on to three and four. But um, the players enter line 420. It's quite a long, long scene, act two, scene two. And the players enter, four or five of them. And Hamlet says, you are welcome, masters, welcome all. Note that he's not speaking now like, a, an, uh, like the uh, prince that he is. He's speaking like a commoner. He's one of them. In the theater um, where you stand upon the stage, uh, you play a role, and, and there's freedom in that. If you think about it as the king, for a time you can be a commoner. If you think about how restrictive it is to be a king, you can't do what you want to do, well, you can do anything now. So there's liberty that comes with the theater in, in acting in a different role, playing a role. But anyways, he says, you are welcome, masters. Welcome all. I am glad to see thee well. Welcome, good friends. Oh, old friend, why thy face is balanced since I saw thee last. Comest thou to beard me in Denmark? What, my young lady and mistress? By lady, your ladyship is nearer to heaven than when I saw you last. By the altitude of a chopping. Pray God your voice, like a piece of uncurrent gold, may be not cracked within the ring. Masters, you are all welcome. Well, even to, to it like French falconers, fly at anything we see. We'll have a speech straight. Come, give us a taste of your quality. Come, a passionate speech. What speech, my good Lord? I heard thee speak me a speech once, but it was never acted, or if it was, n not above once. For the play I remember pleased not the million. T'was caviary to the general, but it was, as I received it and, and others, whose judgments in such matters cried in the top of mine, an excellent play, well digested in the scenes, set down with as much modesty as cunning. I remember one said that there were no salads in the lines to make the matter savory, nor no matter in the phrase that might indict the author of affection, but called it an honest method, as wholesome as sweet, and by very much more handsome than fine. 
One speech in it I chiefly love, t'was Aeneas's tale to Dido. Now think about this in relation to his Ophelia, but also think of it in relation to Claudius and Gertrude. T'was Aeneas's tale to Dido, and thereabout of it, especially when he speaks of Priam's slaughter, if it live in your memory, begin at this line. Let me see, let me see. The rugged Pyrrhus like the Hyrcanian beast Tis not so. It begins with Pyrrhus. The rugged Pyrrhus, he whose sable arms, black as his purpose, did the knight resemble when he lay couched in the ominous horse, hath now this dread and black complexion smeared with heraldry, more dismal, head to foot, etc., etc. So he recites the whole line. He's committed it to memory himself. And then the Polonius, who is there, for God, my Lord, well spoken with good accent and good discretion. Polonius fancies himself a great critic, a theater critic, and, and will direct others on their speeches. Remember, he was a critic of Hamlet's letter. This is terrible poetry. Oh, the line, the numbers are all wrong. And now he's the critic of the, of the so he, he fancies himself as a man of taste. Uh, now the player does, and he carries on, and on he finds him striking too short at Greeks. His antique sword, rebellious to his arm, lies where it falls, repugnant to command. Unequal matched, Pyrrhus at Priam drives in rage, strikes wide, but with the whiff and wind of his fell sword, the unnerved father falls. Then senseless Ilium, seeming to feel this blow with flaming top, stoops to his base and with a hideous crash takes prisoner Pyrrhus's ear. For lo, his sword, which was declining on the milky head of reverent Priam, seemed in the air to stick. So as a painted tyrant, Pyrrhus stood and like a neutral to his will and matter did nothing. But as we often see against some storm, a silence in the heaven, the rack stands still, the bold wind speechless, and the orb below as hush as death. Anon the dreadful thunder did rend the region. So after Pyrrhus's pause, a roused vengeance sets him new a work, and never did the Cyclops hammers fall on Mars armor, forge for proof return, with less remorse than Pyrrhus's bleeding sword now falls on Priam, etc., etc. And then Polonius' response after all this, this is too long. <laughs> Hamlet, it shall to the barbers with your beard, prithee say on. He's for a jig or a tale of baudry, or he sleeps, come on, come to Hecuba. So Hamlet responding to him is he's only interested if, there's a, there's, if it's corrupt or if there's a dance in it. He's not interested in the, the substantial matters. Play on, come to Hecuba. Now come to Hecuba, and he'll tell the tori story of, of Hecuba. And uh, uh, I'll pick it up in the middle of this. Uh, when she saw Pyrrhus make malicious sport and mincing with his sword her husband's limbs, the instant burst of clamor that she made, unless things mortal move them not at all, would have made milch the burning eyes of heaven and passion in the gods. So Hecuba stands up to defend her husband, as just as Hamlet would have had his mother do so, right? So she loved her husband, and Gertrude did not love his father. This is the thing he wants them to talk about because he's so distressed about his mother's abandonment of his father so soon after his death. And Polonius' response, Look where he has not turned his color and has tears in his eyes. Prithee, no more. Tis well, says Hamlet. I'll have thee speak out the rest of this soon. Good, my lord, will you see the players well bestowed? Do you hear? Let them be well used, for they are the abstract and brief chronicles of the time. After your death, you were better have had a bad epitaph than their ill report while you live. So he's talking here now about the function of theater. It's the, the theater is the abstract and the brief chronicles of the time. So long before the phrase in German exists, the Zeitgeist, they are the spirit of the age. They, they record the manners and uh, history of the world. And you better watch out because after you're dead, you'd be better off, you better not be against the 
uh, playwrights or they will write you an ill report and everyone afterwards will think you're a villain, so, which is true. Macbeth. Like Macbeth. The, the real Macbeth history was not actually that bad of a guy. Correct, but that doesn't matter. That does not matter. It's the power of the pen. My Lord, I will use them according to their desert. God's bodkin man, much better. Use every man after his desert, and who shall escape whipping? Use them after your own honor and dignity. The less they deserve, the more merit is in your bounty. Take them in. Measure for measure. I'll give them what they deserve. Give them better. You, if everyone got what he deserved, none of us would escape. So he's aware of, the, of sin and the need for grace. It's in those lines right there. Come, sirs. Okay, okay so on and on. And now he comes, uh, having seen all this and the play and how it's portrayed, his next great soliloquy. Now I am alone. This is line 549. Remember, this is a, is a, a very long scene. And this is a very long speech for him to utter. He walks up stage to the front and thinks about this. Now I am alone. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit that from her working all the visage wand, he went pale, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit. And all for nothing, for Hecuba. What's Hecuba to him, or he to Hecuba, that he should weep for her? What would he do had he the motive and the cue for passion that I have? He would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear with horrid speech make mad the guilty and appall the free, confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears. Yet I, a dull and muddy metalled rascal, peak like John of dreams, unpregnant of my cause and can say nothing. No, not for a king upon whose property and most dear life a damned defeat was made. Am I a coward? Who calls me villain, breaks my pate across, plucks off my beard and blows it in my face, tweaks me by the nose, gives me the lie of the throat as deep as to the lungs? Who does me this? Ha! Swoons, I should take it, for it cannot be, but I am pigeon-livered and lack gall to make oppression bitter. Or ere this, I should have fatted all the region kites with that, this slave's awful the guts of the king. I would already have gutted him. Bloody body villain, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain. Why, what an ass am I? This is most brave that I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell, must like a whore unpack my heart with words and fall a cursing like a very drab, a stallion, Fie upon it, foe, up, about my brains, hum. I have heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play have by the very cunning of the scene been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions. For murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle. I'll observe his looks. I'll tent him to the quick. If I, if I do blench, I'll know my course. The spirit that I have seen may be a devil. And the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape. Yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. I'll have grounds more relative than this. The play is the thing we're in. I'll catch the conscience of the king. Okay. So he upbraids himself for his inability to act. So he's, he loathes himself. There's no doubt about the self-loathing here. But then he talks about his state of melancholy. So he talks about his weakness and his melancholy, which 
allows the devil an entrance into him. And that's his fear here. So note that he dissociates his emotional state, as we would call it, the melancholy in which he's uh, fallen, with his openness to being misdirected by spirits. And so that's the thought he has now. So he, he starts with he's just upset and, and distraught that even though the player was so passionate and moved about something that he didn't suffer, he could not act even though he has far greater cause. But now he moves to the thought again that he needs to make more certain of it and he keeps finding means and excuses for not acting. But now he will be sure about it, but he has to get in his own mind the clarity before he's willing to act. But I think it's quite uh, interesting. So again, and the, the view of psychology that Shakespeare presents here is far more sophisticated and comprehensive than that of our day, where it's really largely a material thing. You know, there's a, a, a brain chemistry is the issue, and that's it. You know, there's a brain chemical that's off. Which there are, by the way, there are chemicals in the brain and pills do have an effect on them and they're sometimes helpful. But that to reduce everything to a material cause is a very simplistic view. Shakespeare is a much broader view. There's, there's a, a physical cause, there's a familial cause, there's a relational cause, there's a moral cause, the sense of sin. All of these things come into play. And then there's the supernatural agency, which we saw he dealt with in the play Macbeth. All of these are possible uh, causes and some of them open their way to other things. I think this is a very broad and I think quite uh, realistic portrait of the of the challenge. Yes. I know what I'll do. I'll get them to act. Yeah, I'll get somebody else to. I know, right, but that, but again, and that sounds like again. Well, you're just. You know, you're, you're procrastinating again. You're putting it off till tomorrow. That's what procrastinate was. But by the way, cross is tomorrow. Pushing off to tomorrow. Yeah. To procrastinate is to put off to tomorrow what you're supposed to do today. You've heard of that, right? Or you recognize it perhaps, yeah. Um, he, uh, yeah, it's essay time. Uh, <laughs> um, he's pushing that off. Uh, and, and thereby the thing that he, he is upbraiding himself for not being able to act, he can push that off to another day. He's going to let them act. But there's more to it than that. He is actually, it is a form of action. And Shakespeare's demonstrated that from our very first play, Midsummer Night's Dream, that the theater is a way of acting. The imagination is the very thing that allows somebody to act when, when the imagination is wedded with the reason and the passions and, and is rightly directed. So he's, he is trying to recover. He's, fr he's a fragmented individual, and the, the theater is the way of recovering himself, as well as exposing the king. I think that's what's going on here. So sh sh Hamlet is very much like a Shakespeare orchestrating events here. Yes? Note that it's called mental health, even. We attenuate it with the adjective. For Shakespeare, there's health. Right. It's called sanity. Right? Because san sane is his health. It's the Latin word. So you have health. And the mental health, well, that's, that's part of the whole picture. It's not a separate picture. Whereas mental health is now its own thing. It's a divided discipline. It doesn't take the, the whole person into view and the whole person in relation to the whole world and the metaphysical nature of life. So you've heard me critique psychology. It's not because I don't think it's important. It's because I think it's very important. That's why. And the modern discipline of psychology, I think, is not taking the whole picture. It rejects it because of its methodological naturalism, among other things. Yes? Is this also relevant because of the view of, like Shakespeare viewed, um, theater as being didactic. So is this not also Hamlet using that same thought process to say, say that? Yeah, he wants to. He, he so wants he wants to, to catch teach, the conscience of the, the conscience. So he's teaching. So but he's more teaching than that, that, when we come yeah. into the scene, his mum's going to be there, right? And he he sees her responding and says, "Yes, you see that." Yeah. He wants her because he wants her back. 
He wants her to be the woman that he was mum before and now is the traitor to his father. He wants the restoration, so he's trying to redeem her by getting her to be, act rightly. But that's again like Shakespeare. He, he's not just presenting things. He knows that we are beings, as Aristotle say, that love imitation. She wants, she will respond to this. So it's not just entertainment. Shakespeare never thinks that the plays that he is writing are mere entertainment. They are always instructive. And he takes his uh, role and responsibility very seriously uh, by including comedy. Funny old thing. Because life is pretty funny and pretty tragic. And he weds the two throughout his plays. The comedy, the tragedy, this, there is both. And that is part of the medicine. Laughter is good medicine, right? Anyway, so let's move on to Act 3 because I haven't got anywhere here. It's now 10-3, my goodness, and I'm nowhere. This, I'm, it's not procrastination, but it's just running off at the mouth. Uh, but he is still, so Act 3, Scene 1 introduces the court again, the king, the queen, Polonius, Ophelia, Rosencrantz, Guildenstern, and lords, sans Hamlet. Uh, he is still, we, we find him uh, disillusioned with people in general and in particular with women and the deceit of women. Now, this is a common uh, refrain in medieval thought, medieval Christian thought. There's a regular lament for how women have brought about the downfall of men over and over. So it's regular, you know, Solomon and all his wives, and David and Bathsheba, and Adam and Eve, and where it's the woman, and there's this lament. A modern feminist would say, here you go, here's the misogyny. And there's no doubt there's an aspect to it. But remember, I see it as it's, it's the perspective of the man here. It's not making a statement about what, the way things are. It's making a statement of how, how they're perceived by the man. I think at least that's part of it. Because you will find that there are female ca characters that are equally uh, misandrous towards men in Shakespeare's plays. And nobody bats an eye at that, right? But so they are, and they're both rightly aggrieved. Yes? I think it just mirrors the situation. Of course it does. The woman uh, affects the man and the man likes her. So there's no, there's faults on both ends, so I don't really get the... Well, in the account of the fall in Genesis, um, God says, where are you? So he comes out, where are you? They're hiding. Why are you hiding? Oh. And Adam says... The woman you gave me. <laughs> so there's two blames going on there, by the way. The woman, yes, but that you gave me. So he's blaming God. The woman you gave me, she did this. And then she says, it's the serpent. And nobody says that it's their own. Nobody owns up to it. It's all passing the buck, right? So I think that's a part of this. Dot. It's a dramatic. Remember, these are, are, are this isn't theology. It's human experience acting and these are realistic expressions who who as a man has not blamed women for things and vice versa just and it tends to be the opposite sex that we blame for such things but at any rate um, so they they are discussing this and of course this is in the center of the play what they're going to do with Hamlet everything's revolving around Hamlet interestingly enough even though Hamlet has got no power they're still very concerned about him well that's because he's the legitimate heir and they need to deal with the problem of Hamlet. But Hamlet now enters and, and gives another soliloquy, and this is maybe his most famous of all. You'll recognize it. Line 55, Act 3, Scene 1. And he's contemplating suicide. He's already said that the Almighty hath fixed his canon against self-slaughter. He said that right at the beginning of the play. That's how melancholy he was. He's contemplating suicide, but he knows that to do that would be to be damned, be in hell, to have no hope, no sense of the providence that God could bring a, uh, something out of the wreckage of his life, just given up, as if he were the, you know, he <coughs> it's not to say that he isn't an agent, it's to deny God's agency. That's the point of despair. It denies that God is God and could enact in accordance with his sovereign agency and change your situation. 
that's the point of why suicide is a bad thing. It denies that God is God. So that it's, that's, that's the issue. But he, he's still in this place. So having just resolved to have this play, it still speaks to his melancholy and despair, or almost despair. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing, end them. To die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep, to sleep perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come? When we have shuffled off this mortal coil, must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes, when he himself might his quietest make with a bare bodkin? Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country, from whose born no traveler returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all. And thus the native sore hue of resolution is sicklied o'er with the pale cast of thought and enterprises of great pitch and moment with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Soft you now, the fair Ophelia. Nymph, in thy orisons be all my sins remembered. Orisons are prayers. So he sees her and refers to her as a nymph. Okay. Um, and she's praying. May you be remembering my sins in your prayers as well. Praying for God's forgiveness of my sins and so forth. But this is the, this is the mindset with which he then greets her. So he's got this meditation on suicide, quite frankly. He's weary of life, but he's terrified of what would come after life. And note that he almost seems at this stage, he doesn't, he's not moved on to get a sense of even having the uh, prospect of using the theater to act. That doesn't seem to console him. He seems less uh, sure of heaven and hell now than he was before. Less sure. He seems more, we don't know what's going to happen after death. Before, when he began the play, he was quite sure of it. At least that's how it seemed to me. And it's been thrown into chaos by all the events here, which seem to contradict um, God's providential rule. Um, the play offered a place where the uh, depravity of life um, and the suffering of life were set to one side where you could act uh, in an, a place inviolate. It's a sort of a sacred realm on which you can play a part and get away from your life. So it's an escape of sorts. And that the idea of a world as a stage is the model for, for Hamlet here. But he, when he, now he's come back from that thought, he's still back where he was. In fact, he might even be more desperate. And so he speaks, and then he speaks to Ophelia. And the, the confrontation here um, is, is Shakespe uh, Shakespeare's critics have speculated on this, is, is Shakespeare expressing in the role of Hamlet the skepticism that was rampant in Europe in the 16th century, and Shakespeare's own skepticism about religious matters. Um, to, ki to kill Claudius would be to be, to kill himself would be not to be. Which do I do? Somebody's going to have to die here. It's not just living or not living. It's am I going to be and am I going to act or am I going to take my own life and exist no more? I've got to do one or the other, though. I have to act. And it doesn't seem like the action 
that he has just contemplated through the play within the play is giving him much hope. So he's still burdened by melancholy, we would call it depression. Yes? Sure. If he's if if he if he is revealed to um, have done so justly, for sure. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it, he's a murderer of the king, and he's a you know they're going to hang him on the spot. But if he says this man murdered my father and so forth. It's also personal virtue, isn't it? Personal virtue. It's uh, it, it's doing what. Uh, it's it's administrating justice. He's the means of justice, and the king would be that in Shakespeare's day as well. He's the, he's the representative of God on earth. It's his job to make sure that justice is done in his kingdom. He might not have the office, but he still has the responsibility to do the just thing. He can't appeal to the law because the king control, controls that. He still has to do the just thing. Um, and, and so even with all of those things in light, in, in front of him, he still can't act. He knows what the right thing to do is, and yet he doesn't want to do it. Now, to me, this is psychologically probable. It's not uh, for the philosopher in this, or uh, the, the even just weighing it up, well, this is the right thing to do, so well, then just do it. <laughs> it's just, just do it. But that's, it's not quite so simple in terms of, of actually acting. And so Hamlet it, it seems afraid of killing Claudius because while the ghost might be an illusion, there might be no afterlife. And he's afraid of killing himself because the laws of heaven, if it exists, are against that. But it, it's, it is literally if it exists. We don't know. It's the undiscovered country now. He's speaking like an agnostic. Is he really an agnostic? Is it reflecting Shakespeare's thoughts? I think not. I never think that I, one character reflects Shakespeare's thoughts. I think he's reflecting a man who has uh, confronted all the things that Hamlet has and uh, is quite frankly seeing a very amoral universe, just like Lear did, right? That's, it's psychologically probable. Why do people think that there's no God and no order? Because they see no God and they see no order. And if I'm the one who's going to restore it, I'm not a very good guarantor of the moral legitimacy of that order. He's aware of his own frailty. Anyway, it's part of the, but people talk about the, what, the stages of grief. He's still in the stages. He's angry at his mother. He's in denial about his own role. He's like, he's not ready yet. Now the confrontation with Ophelia, why does he act the way he does? This is a strange scene. It really is an odd scene. Does he ex suspect that there are, are, are eavesdroppers? I, I think so. So he knows that she is now a player in the act uh, and that her strings are being pulled because he knows who she is. It's not that he despises her. He knows that unfortunately she's a pawn in the great scheme of things and she, there's nothing she can do about it. They are just, they're, they're like two little players being buffeted about by great winds and she's not responsible fully on the other hand he can't stop her fully and so he he's quite rude to her get thee to a nunnery accuses her of being a a slut basically i mean there's all sorts of it's it's really bad it's abusive language why is he doing it is it to um is it to break her is it to save her you know he's pushing her away to keep her from uh being caught up in the whole mess, right? Because if, if, she, if, if, if she can be used by the king and Polonius, she's going to get more and more central. But if he pushes her away, then they're going to leave her alone and not use her anymore so she can, he can keep her out of it. I'm giving the best take I can on it. It's hard. Or, is he, or is he just angry at women and so he's taking it out on her in the way he'd like to take it out on his mother? Could be, all, all, all probable. It depends how much we see his love of uh, Ophelia here, or if he's just totally disenchanted with women and is happy to be abusive. That's entirely probable here. 
And if he, if he thinks that she's cooperating with the king and Polonius, he now, she's, on the, she's against him. So again, it's a betrayal. So he's gonna, he's a, he, she's just like his mother. So that explains it as well. Now she doesn't know anything about it, and so she's broken by this, this little exchange. Um, let me move to Act 3, Scene 2 very quickly because we've got two seconds now. That, and, and Hamlet gives his view, his, teaches the actor his view of theater here, and it's a very ordered view of the world. And the, he speaks of this, the metaphor here that any Renaissance playwright would have uh, grasped that there is a mirror. I, I cite this regularly. Speak the speech, I pray, pr pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of our players do, I had as lived the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand thus, but use all gently from the very torrent tempest, and as I may say, whirlwind of your passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Oh, it offends me to the soul to hear of a busterous periwig Hated fellow, tear a passion to totters, to the very rags, to split the ears of the groundlings, who for the most part are capable of nothing but inexplicable dumb shows and noise. I'd have such a fellow whipped. Um, then he gives further uh, advice. I warrant your honor. Avoid it. I warrant your honor. Be not too tame, neither. But let your own discretion be your tutor. Your discretion. What's appropriate? Use your moral judgment, use your aesthetic judgment. You, all of these things are part. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance, that you o'erstep not the modesty of nature. For anything so or done is from the, pur from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is to hold as twere the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time his form and pressure. So this famous line, he's going to hold, hold the mirror up to nature and note that he's going to show virtue. There's a connection between nature and moral virtue here. And he sees them again as part of this picture of, of sanity. Physical health, moral health, they are united. And you're going to hold the mirror up to it, and you have there has to be a modesty. You can't, don't overact, don't underact. Get it, it, the balance exactly right. Use your discretion. This is the moral counsel. It's the counsel of the Renaissance pl playwright, but it would be the counsel of every Christian playwright throughout the ages, and it would be, I would say, even in the classical world, actually. So good theater, good uh, acting, and good play uh, writing will have that in view. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave it off that just because we run out of time.